So let's do social inequality for the exam tomorrow. So um, obviously you need to know each of the cages and how they would disadvantage an individual. And then the evaluation is the idea that either other aspects of the cage are more significant or it could be like it still affects or no longer affects um, your life chances. So for ethnicity, if ethnicity comes up, um, the three areas that you need to focus on are work, crime and education. So for work, you can talk about the concrete ceiling, the idea that they can't see the promotions um, and therefore can't access them. And you can talk about the unemployment rate. So um, Pakistani and Bangladeshi are the most likely to be unemployed and their unemployment rate is 20%. Uh, for crime, you can talk about institutional racism, eight times more likely to be stopped and searched. And for education, you can talk about ethnocentric curriculum and labelling and any other factors that disadvantage ethnic minorities in education. So if the question is um, ethnicity still affects life chances, that means your against will be that it no longer affects life chances. So your against will be Race Relations Act, so you can use that for anything to do with employment, so saying that these disadvantages no longer apply because discrimination is illegal. And then you can also use Crime and Disorder Act, so um, the police can no longer discriminate based on ethnicity because um, you have to write down reasons why you've stopped and searched someone, and obviously you can't use um, ethnicity is a factor and they also wear the little badges on their vests so the, the police can monitor um, who the officers have been stopping and searching. Okay, so that's ethnicity. For age, the three areas to work uh, to cover are work, media and crime. Um, so for work you can talk about 22% of 16 to 24 year olds are not in employment, education or training. Uh, you can talk about, talk about institutional, institutional ageism, so the idea that uh, people discriminate based on um, age, so old people are stereotyped as incapable of completing their job, whereas young people are stereotyped as lazy and unreliable. Um, the media, so you can talk about how the media represents young people as deviant, it makes them into folk devils, it scapegoats them for problems in society. And the last thing to talk about is crime, so you can talk about how uh, the police label young people, they're more likely to stop and search them uh, because they've been, again, stereotyped. Um, you're against for age, you can talk about Age Discrimination Act, so Age Discrimination Act is has prevented age discrimination, you can talk about the idea that they no longer put, uh, require you to put your age or a photo on your CV, and then you can also do Crime and Disorder Act, so same idea that you can't stop and search anyone without stating why, and they have the cameras on their jackets, so to prevent the police from disproportionately stopping youths. Uh, gender, so gender obviously technically it's women that are more disadvantaged in society so if it talks about, um, yeah if it talks about women being disadvantaged then you can do work, the family and either politics or media, it's up to you what you feel more comfortable talking about. But for work, you can talk about the glass ceiling, you can talk about the 10% pay gap. Um, you can talk about triple shift in domestic violence, segregated conjugal roles for the family. And for politics, you can talk about only 28% of MPs are female because of gender stereotypes, etc. And if you wanted to do media instead, you could talk about the gender stereotypes and you can talk about like hyper-reality um, as a consequence. If you want to, if the question is just about gender and how it disadvantages people, you could also talk about how it disadvantages men. And obviously in terms of like a five mark, it could also be one way that men are disadvantaged in society. So the, the key way that men are disadvantaged is obviously the education system. 
So in a in a five mark, you'd be like one way men are disadvantaged in education. Um, you support that with a, with a statistic, or or just say like they're more likely to underachieve. So only fifty five percent of boys get five A star to C compared to sixty five percent of girls. Um, and then three reasons why that you would give. Uh, you could say teacher labelling. You could say subcultures. You could say the crisis in masculinity. Um, it's kind of it. Um, so you could use that as a paragraph in your essay as well if you want to kind of broaden the idea of gender being a key area of disadvantage. Um, for your evaluation, so if the essay you're talking about the different ways that women are disadvantaged, you could talk about Sex Discrimination Act and Equal Pay Act have come in, so now we've got equal opportunities in the workplace, and you could talk about the new man and joint conjugal roles in the family. Um, what's the other thing I was just about to say? Oh, and in terms of education, is that you wanted to say like how it's improved for boys? You could say that we've now um, scrapped coursework because girls were doing much better at coursework than boys were. So now we scrapped that. That's kind of giving boys an advantage again. Okay, last part of cage. So we'll do social class. So the three ways that the working class are disadvantaged: uh, crime, poverty, and education. So for crime, talk about relative deprivation. In a, and inadequate socialisation causing people to commit crime. Uh, poverty, you can talk about the concept of relative poverty and how 20% of the population are living in poverty and you could say like how the welfare state is failing to reduce poverty, poverty trap, etc. Um, and last one, talk about education and say how working class is so significantly disadvantaged in education, so only 35% achieve by they start to see if they're on free school meals and the barriers of like material and cultural deprivation. Against, um, you can talk about benefit systems, so you can say that the working class aren't as disadvantaged now because we have benefits, we have a welfare state. And you could talk about compensatory education, so any policies that support the working class and, and aid their achievements, so um, EMA, EAZs, people premium. Uh, not people, uh, well, yeah, uh, top of these. Okay, that's cage done. So just remember, class still affects life chances, means it does, best it doesn't anymore. If it's class is the main factor, it's class, and then gender and ethnicity, or whatever. Um, and if it says anything about just social groups being disadvantaged, social groups is like any category. So you can do a paragraph on class, a paragraph on ethnicity, and a paragraph on gender. So just bear that in mind. Okay, so for poverty, uh, you need to know the two approaches to the causes of poverty. So the cultural perspective, so this is like functionalism and new right, they blame the poor and they blame their norms and values. So, the first point you would make in this essay is culture of poverty. So the culture of poverty is that the norms and values of the poor keep them in poverty. And the first value they have is fatalism. So that's when you accept your fate, you're always going to be poor, so you don't see the point in trying to change your situation. And immediate gratification is... Um, when you want rewards instantly, so when your benefits come in, you um, spend them instantly rather than trying to save. Next one, cycle of deprivation. This continues through each generation because your parents socialise you into those same values that are part of the culture of poverty. Um, so it's just going to carry on repeating itself. And then last one, culture of dependency. So the culture of dependency is the idea that it's deemed acceptable uh, to claim benefits. So you could talk about like media representation, etc. And like people thinking it's now um, a norm in society that you would be claiming benefits and essentially scamming from the welfare state. The against is that it's structural factors, so it's it's the fault of society and the government that are why some people are in poverty and they can't escape it. So poverty trap is the idea that when you get a promotion you lose your benefits. So it um, discourages people from seeking promotions because they end up financially worse off. 
um, failure of the welfare state, so um, minimum wage benefits, etc., aren't enough. So, yeah, people are still in poverty. And then the Marxist view. Oh, sorry, Marxist view is the structure of society. So there's always going to be people at the bottom of society that have been exploited by the rich because the elite are always going to have the power and the power to control us and that is just how society will work. Therefore, those people are never going to be able to um, achieve social mobility because everything's based on the concept of ascribed status. So that's that. In terms of conclusion, um, it pains me to say this, but it is quite easy to agree with the new right and agree with the cultural perspective, even though I really don't, um, you could say that society is meritocratic and if you want to achieve you can, therefore it is your own fault if you're in poverty. If you want to agree with structural, which obviously is what I do agree with, um, you could just say that like the government are claiming that they're supporting and have this kind of the false idea that we have a meritocratic society and we have support in place from the government through our welfare state but actually that's just a bit of a facade because all of the policies have actually failed and people are still unable to get out of poverty. Um, okay then also in poverty you need to know the four different definitions and their advantages and disadvantages. So first one absolute poverty, the people who cannot afford the basic um, necessities to live for example food shelter advantage of the definition is it identifies the very poorest of the poor disadvantage is that it's not applicable to the U applicable to the uk because we have a welfare state therefore we don't have people that can't afford food um next definition relative poverty so it's much more applicable to the uk because we can see um who doesn't have the standard of living that most people have um, that's the definition as well um, and the problem with relative poverty is those people might not be very poor like it's not um, that significant they're just not achieving the standards of living that other people around them are but that doesn't mean that they're really struggling uh, subjective poverty so this is where you ask people how they feel do they feel poor advantage is that it recognises the feelings of people in society, um, but the disadvantage is that it's opinion based and, you know, people can lie. Um, environmental, so this is when the area that a person lives in is considered and if you live in a poor area you're defined as being in poverty. Um, an advantage of that is it looks at the implications of being in a poor area, so like poor schooling, poor health facilities, um, poor leisure activities, etc. Um, but the disadvantage is just because you live in a poor area doesn't mean that you're poor. So you could just be on like quite a, a middle class, expensive street, but the rest of the area is poor. Um, obviously, there's the dreaded five mark that could be. Um, identify one way of defining poverty and explain why it's better than another way I would always use absolute and relative so I would say relative is um, people who cannot afford the standard of living that everyone else can whereas absolute is people who cannot afford the basic necessities um, relative is more useful because it's applicable to the UK because it looks at um, the compares the standard of living to everyone else, whereas absolute poverty is not applicable to the UK because we don't have that high levels of poverty due to our welfare state. So that would be your first one. So relative is applicable to the UK, absolute isn't. Your second point is um, relative poverty can always be used. That definition will always apply. So they calculate it sort of on if you earn less than 50% of the average household income then you're deemed as in relative poverty so that can always be used because it would the figure would just change as the um, average income increases so we can always use that definition it will apply to any society in any time period we can always calculate uh, who's in poverty by that definition whereas in absolute poverty you can't because what's deemed a basic necessity will change over time um, 
and by culture. So like our definition of shelter, for example, in the UK is very different from how it might be uh, defined in, I don't know, like India or um, East African countries where they have lots of, of slums, that kind of thing. So um, it's not applicable to different countries or different time periods. Um, the next thing you need to know is how we measure poverty. So the three key ways that we measure poverty are benefit statistics, household income and the Breadline Britain survey. And I would learn advantages and disadvantages of all of those and again do a little comparison question. So using benefit statistics, so data from the government of um, how many people claim benefits in the UK, advantages um, would be that it's secondary data, so it's already collected, you don't have to do that yourself. A uh, disadvantage is that not everybody who's entitled to benefits will claim them out of shame and benefit fraud means that people are claiming them when they're actually not in poverty. Um, household income, so you could say it's good because it measures relative poverty um, because you can see what the average household income in, is and how people compare to that. Um, and the disadvantage of household income is you could say it's about money rather than material possessions. So just because someone earns a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean that they spend that money in the correct way. And it doesn't necessarily mean like, for example, their children won't be in poverty. Um, and Breadline Britain survey advantages, it looks at the material possessions so we can see like what people actually have. Like, do they have a bed? Do they have a fridge? Do they have um, what else would be what else would be a dressing gown is what the survey says uh, but also you could say it's subjective as what should be on that survey so like the Breadline Britain surveys like can you eat meat twice a week um, but obviously if you don't eat meat if you're a vegetarian or whatever that doesn't mean like you would say no to that question but that doesn't mean you're in poverty so it's subjective like what they include in the list doesn't necessarily mean that you're in poverty or not um in terms of the comparison question so household income is relative so household income is a good method to use because it measures relative poverty so it's more applicable to the UK whereas the Breadline Britain survey is not that useful because um, everyone in the UK has a bed, everyone in the UK can afford food so the items on the survey people can afford because you're only measuring absolute poverty whereas um, yeah the income is more measuring relative poverty um, household income allows you to see patterns and trends over time so you can see like how the household income rate has changed and what most people the average income is whereas you can't use the breadline Britain survey anymore it's very outdated the things that they talk about having are, um, are not that relevant so they say like oh you need to have a bath to not be in poverty whereas some people just have like one of those fancy wet room things or a shower like it doesn't mean that they're not that they're in poverty just because they don't have a bath or because they don't own a dressing gown and all those kind of things. So you can say household income can be used over lots of periods of time and you can identify those patterns and trends whereas the um, Breadline Britain survey is very outdated and the items on it are just quite stupid really. Last thing, like one of the main sort of key debates that you could get is the concept of uh, whether our stratification system, so how the social groups are categorised in our society, whether that's an open system or a closed system. So is social mobility possible? Is our society meritocratic? Or are we in a, a closed society that's based on ascribed status and we can't actually move up and down the system? So in terms of the debate, the functionalist view is that we do live in a meritocratic society. So you can do one paragraph on functionalism, our society is meritocratic, this means you can move up and down the social class system based on hard work um, and you could talk about the idea of it being an open society and that our merit is based on achieved status, so our social position is based on um, what we've achieved. 
Then another paragraph which is also functionalist is the concept of social mobility, so define what social mobility is and then I'd use like a specific example of how you can achieve that through education and just say that that's what the education system is there for, it's to get people from the working class. One of the key functions of education is to get people from working class to become more educated so they've got the skills to therefore um, attain a, working, a middle class job. Um, also in this you can talk about the idea that the barriers of discrimination have now been removed through anti-discrimination laws and policies so you can say that our society is now meritocratic because of Age Discrimination Act, Race Relations Act, um, Sex Discrimination Act etc meaning that those barriers can no, no longer exist and other policies such as EMA, um, top up fees, um, benefits, etc., reduce the or eradicate the barriers of discrimination, so therefore we have an open society. Against is obviously ascribed status. What the hell does that say? Oh, closed society. So we live in a closed society, um, and if you inherit money and you inherit like capital so you could talk about like the old boys network etc they will get you into places in society but if you don't have those then you can never um, achieve a high position. Um, another paragraph you could talk about the disadvantage that the working class face in education compared to the advantage that middle class people have and obviously education is kind of the main factor that determines your job in the future so um, talk about the material and cultural deprivation that the working class face as opposed to the cultural and economic capital that the middle class have to advantage them and then and how that re reproduces the inequalities and then lastly you could talk about society isn't meritocratic and social mobility is not possible because of the glass and concrete ceiling so say how women are always going to be relatively deprived and ethnic minorities will always be relatively deprived because of the discrimination that they face. Um, um, and then for conclusion you could say that our society will always remain um, a closed system and social mobility will be very difficult because it's within the interest of the elite to make sure that our society stays that way because they want to maintain their power so any policies like um, top up fees or discrimination law, anti-discrimination laws etc are, are not policed very well or don't aren't as effective as they could be because they're made by the people that want to actually maintain their power in society. Um, and also in terms of conclusions for their like ethnicity, age, gender, class, I guess you could always say that it will always affect your life chances if you are from any of those groups because the stereotypes is just is just getting passed on by the next generation because every time uh, someone fulfills their stereotype it, and lives up to the labels, so has a self-fulfilling self -fulfilling prophecy that will um, continue through the next generations as a cultural norm that that's how that, that group is perceived. Um, in terms of like the main factor that affects discrimination, I guess you could say like ethnicity and gender are more significant than age and class because you can say that ethnicity and gender you can't change about yourself whereas um, age and well obviously I know in some circumstances you can't change your gender but generally people don't want to change their gender. Um, so age and social class, obviously everyone's age changes and social class you can change. So you could say that those discrimination barriers would remove once you get higher up the social class system. Um, and I guess you could say something like ethnicity, the discrimination or the disadvantages of your life chances are often a result of your social class because the... Um, ethnic minority groups that are disadvantaged tend to be working class so those kind of things you can sort of link together um, and just be aware of what the word life chances means so life chances can be used as like a term in the essay and it just means like 
it means this. So like the different areas of society, how are you advantaged or disadvantaged because of your social group. So the life chances are like work, crime, education, media, family, politics, and then just link whatever you want in and whatever statistics you can remember. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So good luck my little gems and um, I'll be in the bubble tomorrow um, as soon as you get out your English exam. So good luck.